Do these work? Hello, everyone. I'm sharing a microphone, and I like hugging, so it works out. <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome to DroidCon. You guys have been here before or not. You've been here yesterday or today. Anyway, now we're going to do our presentation. Go. That's it. That's all you get from me. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to either give a presentation on uh, PSIs, and these PSIs are from my perspective and the work I've been doing since I've jo basically joined the club. I'll go over a little bit of the agenda I'm going to start with. Um, so we're going to go over a little introduction. Um, if anyone's heard my presentations before, I like to have what I call toolbox moments, things I've learned along the way and I put into my toolbox to use at a later date. Um, I'm going to kind of go through some of the motivation of why do I do this? Uh, why did I start doing this? Um, the history before I started working on PSIs. Um, and I'm going to go over some metrics, which was pretty eye-opening to me when I wanted to put together this slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about the hardware, which I do. Um, and then also what's equally as important is the firmware, the software that runs on the PSIs. Um, going to have a little talk about future, and then I'm going to open it up for if there's any questions that I didn't answer. Uh, so introduction. Who am I? Um, my name is Brett Borbin, uh, Selgus on the uh, site. Um, my background is I worked at a company called Catapult. Uh, we made... Um, a video game modem. Um, so we built our own electronics that allowed you to play games over basically the internet, uh, console games. Um, right now I work at Electronic Arts. Um, and what I do, uh, what I did at uh, Catapult is I made hardware and software for commercial. Um, so things that you buy in a store. Um, at EA, I work on the engine for some of the most popular games. Uh, what I do for those engines that I work on, I used, well, I, what I used to do, is work on low-level code um, and doing uh, very performant embedded systems. So what have I been doing for the club is I've been building these PSIs. Uh, people know them as uh, the Vader PSIs. So talked about, uh, you know, along the way I'm going to have these slides about different things I've learned and I put into my toolbox. Uh, so what was my motivation for doing this? So uh, these are some clips from uh, movies, uh, Star the original Star Wars movies, of the different PSIs. And what I wanted to do was how, uh, how could I get a screen accurate PSI for my droid? Uh, that's all I really cared about at the time was how, how can I represent that? Um, and I looked at what was being done in the club, and it really didn't necessarily match what was in the movie. Um, so how could I um, improve upon that? And how could I make it in a way that um, people could enhance it? Um, and that can be offered to the club at, at a, a later date, you know, once I finished mine, would other people want this? Is this, is this a way I can contribute back to the club? And the main motivation for me was this was fun. I mean, I like building things. I'm, I'm a builder. Um, I like creating things. I like innovating. Um, as a lot of you know me, I iterate on things a lot. Um, and to me, that's the, the journey is the fun part. So a little bit of history. And again, this is history from my perspective. Um, it's probably some of it is wrong, but this is, this is how I knew the, the history of PSIs. So we started out with these um, commercial blinkers. Uh, basically a very simple circuit, you know, two transistors, a capacitor um, to, to charge it, and it flips between two colors. So there would be two LEDs on here, one LED one color, one LED a different color, and it would just oscillate between the two of them. Um, there's the Hyperdyne uh, PSIs, 
And now, instead of having one LED for doing that, they had uh, two LEDs in each color um, doing the same type of thing. So we have some fixed color LEDs put on this board, and you can uh, flip between them. Um, th this was being run off of a pick. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I don't know which pick it was, um, but there's there's a little bit of code running on there to do this. Um, then Dan introduced his PSIs, and again we have some discrete LEDs that could flip between two different colors. Um, he made one for front and back, depending upon which LEDs you put it on there. Uh, that would designate which colors you can see. Um, then we had the Jedi displays. Uh, again, we have a small board which has two LEDs on it, and um, he was running it off a propeller, so he had a, um, Scott had this whole system um, that would drive these boards, but again, we have some discrete LEDs that will flip between two different colors. Um, Mike introduced you know, his PSIs running off, and again, I'm not sure which pick he was using, um, but he introduced some more LEDs in here. So part of the problem, and I've, I had this conversation with a very well-known droid builder who's been in the club forever, and he was telling me how in the movies they flip between these two colors, and it's like, no, that's not what happens. Um, but now we start to get a little more granular, and so we can have more of what actually you do see in the movies. Now, what you see in the movies, um, the different movies do slightly different things because in the first movie, the thing was broken. Um, but, uh, but now we can get closer to mimicking it in the club. Uh, then the TCs came out. And this is what lots and lots of people run uh, because they did some really cool things here. First, made a system that anyone could build themselves. Um, you can buy kits, you can buy the parts. Um, you can see they have this checkerboard pattern for doing the PSIs. So again, more granular. Um, but again, discrete, discrete colors. Whatever LEDs you put in there, that's the color it's going to be. Um, and part of the research that I was doing, where I showed you that slide of all those screenshots from uh, different movies, was what were the actual colors of those PSIs? And so I was capturing RGB values and averaging them and, and trying to come up with, okay, what is a good average for that? Um, and my research that showed me was all over the map because I'm capturing stuff from screenshots. And, uh, and so like, it's very hard to map that. Just think about trying to find an LED off the shelf that is going to be that exact color. So th this is the reason why when I was looking at what was existing in the club, I think there, there is there a, another way we can be looking at this? Is there another way we can get more screen accurate? And again, me being a builder, is there a way that I could contribute to this? So before I start going into what I did, I wanted to bring up some metrics. So first, how many different versions of PSIs have I done? <laughs> I've built up 19 different versions of PSIs. Um, so that means uh, I, I started off with the Vader PSI, and then I made the next version, so that became the standard, um, and so I had a deluxe. And then after deluxe, I had extreme, after extreme, I had ultimate, and then I made another version on what do you go from ultimate? I was like, very ultimate? Or, um, and so then I started using other names, um, and I started using names from the Star Wars universe, and so I knew I could never run out of those. Um, how many revisions of those 19 versions? I had 73 different revisions. So uh, each one of those versions went through a whole process. And my process is kind of involved because it actually requires me to build up boards. To build up boards means I have to get them manufactured, I get a blank board. You know, I get things like that and then I start working on them. Um, I find problems or I find things I want to add, so I do more revisions. That's how we get to 73. How many PSIs have I built? Okay, so there, there's over 1,250 of these things out in the world. Um, that's a lot. I built a lot of them by hand before I became a little smarter and said I can get someone else to build these for me. Um, but that, that, was, that was a lot. How many LEDs have I bought? Okay, so we're, we're in the range of over 23,000 LEDs. Um, 
you have to get creative when you start buying things at, the, at these quantities when you're just a normal person. Uh, by the way, uh, this is not my job. Um, I am just a guy, and I go to the same websites that you go to to buy things. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a big thing, a big eye opener for me. Um, I spent a lot of time designing the stuff, designing, building, iterating. Um, I did the math. It's, if it's an eight hour day, I've probably spent almost a month straight doing this stuff uh, back to back, which is kind of crazy. Uh, it takes me about 30 minutes if, if I'm uh, in the zone to, to make a complete board by hand. Um, and today, it's a little different than when I started. When I started, well, you'll see from the history of the, of the boards, um, they constantly get more and more LEDs on them. Because they get more LEDs on them means that um, the techniques I use had to change. Um, I can't hand solder uh, things when we start getting that, that, to that scale. Uh, money invested. I left this off the slide. I don't want my wife to see this. Um, <laughs> it's been a lot. Um, there is uh, a lot of money, you know, along with time that goes into this. And how many times have I said this is the last version? It's been four. Um, I allow myself to change that number at a future date. So one of my uh, first toolbox moments was uh, the realization that um, if you want to, you know, things done right require investment, time, money, stuff. You have to be willing to, to put that in else you're just going to frustrate you, you're going to frustrate other people. So that was the first thing I learned when I started doing this process. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware revisions that I went through. So first off, remember my motivation. How can I get screen accuracy? How can I get things as close to what was uh, in those original movies? And that original movie is, you know, Star Wars, Episode Four. They don't use um, uh, LED matrix in that movie. It was mechanical. Um, there was something that was on, I, I guess, a motor or a server or something that um, turned. And it had a halogen light behind the LED, uh, behind the PSI, and the thing would rotate and it would have two different colored lenses over there. And that's how you got your red-blue color. Um, and that is why in the movie, um, if you look back at my screenshots, you see a lot of times it, it looks like, oh, it's in the same spot. It's, a miracle, how do they capture that at the same spot? You're like, well, no, because it broke. Or it would fail, and it would lock on to um, a pattern. And, um, and so I wanted to duplicate that. So I started with this one up here, where I said, OK, let me take you know, a couple of pieces of plastic, uh, col colored um, acrylic, and I will build a little board with one LED on there, and I will use a servo on the top of it, and it would rotate it. And so I did this one, and it's like, okay, square doesn't really work because it's, it's a cylindrical thing. Um, so I did a, a revision on it for the uh, front and back, and this actually looked pretty cool. Um, again, I was limited by what color plastics can I buy. Um, like I can get kind of close. Um, the real hard part for this for me was, how do I mount this thing inside the dome? And so I tried to come up with all different ways that would, one, fit space-wise, and two, um, be reliable. And it, this, I was, this is a rabbit hole. And I said, OK, this is uh, not going to hit all the things I wanted to do. And I, I always came back to, well, what about the color? You know, I'm locked into whatever this is. And so is there a different approach? Um, so another toolbox moment is screen accuracy does not necessarily mean you have to do the same implementation. Um, how do I get to that result regardless? And I, I know there's some purists in the room that will say, you know, we want to build our R2s using the exact same parts that they used in, in the movies. And that's great, too. Um, that was not my motivation. My motivation was how can I make it look like that in the best way I could. So I don't necessarily need to do their same implementation. Um, oh, that's weird. So 
my first iteration of PSIs. I went to a DroidCon back, I guess, in 13. Um, and I made these. Uh, oh, I made, I made this. I, made, I think I made two of them total. Um, and what this was, was I was using a, um, a PIC-12. And this thing doesn't have a lot of, the PIC-12 doesn't have a lot of space on it um, and memory. That's right, there's 25 bytes of memory. This brought me back to when I used to do video games and I worked on the Atari, um, uh, the original Atari VHS. Um, it had 128 bytes of memory. And so we got very creative in how we pack things together. Uh, this was kind of similar. So you'll notice, uh, if you can see this image better, um, notice that there is uh, one, two, three LEDs on here. Now these are RGB LEDs. Um, actually, I'm one, two, four. Um, these are three RGB LEDs, so I could hit my uh, original ob objective of how can I set the, the color exactly the way I want. When, whenever I picked out, this is what RG, you know, RGB red and blue are for the front and yellow and green are, um, I could set that directly. Um, and I figured, okay, I've, I've seen um, what other people have done and they don't use a lot of uh, LEDs, they just need to make it swoop across. So, so my first attempt was three. Okay, let me, let me do this. And, and I was able to duplicate what other people have done in the club now with, with some control over color, but that's basically what I got. Um, so I, I went to DroidCon and I showed this to Mike Irwin. And you know, the first thing he said to me is, well, why are you using a PIC-12? You know, there's this thing called the AVR, there's this um, Atmel part um, that, oh, because I did this all in assembly. Uh, so the, the programming of that first one with the servo and this one is all, was all done in assembly. So, uh, you know, we have C compilers for, for the uh, Atmel, the AVRs. Um, you should think about using that. So went home, did that. It's basically the same design as the original one, um, except now I'm using an Atmel part. Um, now I have 16K of, of flash and I have 1K of RAM, wow. Um, uh, but I, I kept the three LEDs, but also when I was out there, he turned me on to, hey, there's a different type of LED, um, these uh, WS2812s. And the difference between the LED I was using before and this one is these LEDs have a controller on them. So now it's just a protocol you talk to as opposed to what I was doing in the previous version where I had to pulse width modulate the exact colors. So it's a very, it's a timing loop thing. Um, here I have a protocol. Now this one still, there's a timing loop involved in it, uh, but um, I, I have more flexibility. Um, so that was the next version. Um, three LEDs, and these are, these are the five millimeter ones. Um, so the three LEDs, was not where I wanted to be because, you know, I, I, I railed on the things that came before me because, yeah, they were flipping between two things and this was just slightly better than flipping between two things um, and it wasn't giving me a flow, you know. It's supposed to slide from one side to another. So uh, I made a compromise here that I shouldn't have. And so I put that in my toolbox and to say, okay, well, let's, let's not do that. What, what can we do different? Um, so then this was my uh, next version. And what I did here is say, okay, well, let's just keep the old version. And you're going you're gonna to see a kind of theme here. Let's build upon what we did before. Um, and let's add some more LEDs on there. We get more granular. And so basically that's what I did. I went from 3 to 16. That's a big jump. Um, and it was better. Uh, and by the way, you know, up to this point, I mean, everything I'm doing is handmade uh, with a soldering iron. Um, and so you'll notice some holes in the board here. Um, that's because this is a two-sided board and there's stuff on the back and stuff on the front. Um, I don't, if, if you're gonna notice on any one of my boards, none of them have a USB port. Um, when you program them, you program them with um, SPI, spy programming. And 
these don't even actually have connectors. They just have the vias, the, the holes in the, the plated holes in the board where I you know, put something against it to program. Um, I didn't want to have extra stuff on there that I didn't need. And, uh, and so this was, I believe, you know, this was still called just PSI. This is what I call PSI standard. Uh, so then we went to deluxe. And why deluxe is, okay, that was a good iteration, but it wasn't granular enough. How can we add some more LEDs? And so we added more LEDs in here. But another thing you'll notice here is uh, there are no holes here. Um, it's still parts. You don't see a processor on here. You don't see um, my oscillators or, you know, um, virtual control or anything. But if you look up here, you'll see all that stuff. Um, so I went to a dual-sided system here, or, or two different boards here, um, because I couldn't have the, the holes here and still have LEDs on there, um, but I still needed all these parts. So um, we went, I went to a concept of I have a daughter board and a um, LED board, and I, that allows me to mix and match. And this actually uh, paid off for me moving forward, uh, going to this design of two separate boards, each board having a specific functionality. Um, but went through that iteration, and what about customizing it? So I can make these RGB values, um, and they are an approximation of an average as I did over capturing frames. Um, but what if you're not doing R2? What if you're doing some other color scheme? Okay, uh, I, up to this point, all this stuff is this burnt into the flash. Um, I could just say, hey everyone, here's the code to it, and just change the code, recompile it, hope you have you know, pogo pegs to um, reprogram the thing, or you know, do a whole bunch of stuff, or I can think about how would you configure this? Um, is there another way? Is there a way that um, you could have the board tailored to what you want? Um, and so I created the extreme version. Now, again, I did add some more LEDs. So each time when I'm adding LEDs, I am trying to move them closer and closer together, which means it makes it harder and harder for me to work on boards. Um, with a soldering iron. Again, I'm, I'm still in soldering iron land here. And, uh, but now, this is the, um, the CPU board up here. Um, I added this line of pins for a controller board, an external controller board. Now my thinking around this, because I've, I've gotten this question before of, you know, why, just like make it Wi-Fi and you know, use your phone, because that's the biggest rage now. Use your phone to configure it. Um, and it was, okay, there's a lot of circuitry I would need to put on there to make that happen. Um, but also, I'm thinking you do that once and then you're done. And that seems like a big investment for doing it once and, and being done. So it's like, well, is there something, and you have multiple PSIs. Is there something you can plug into it, do it once and plug, you know, unremove, remove it and then be done? Um, and so that's the road I went down. And I created this thing, the calibration board. Uh, the calibration board, uh, these things over here are seven segment LEDs. Um, each pair is a different color, so RGB. Um, I made people learn hex, so I can get from zero to 255 numbers on that. Um, there's a bunch of buttons here for up and down with each of the colors, uh, each of the pairs there. And I have a, um, a command button, you know, some, something that uh, talks to the CPU board. Um, problem with, uh, well, so some, some of the uh, interesting things with this is those LEDs, because this is a very small form factor, it's about the same size as a PSI. Um, to get those LEDs was expensive. There's only like two companies that made them this size in, in surface mount technology. And, um, and there's another limitation because what I do on these configuration boards is 
I all, you know, these are not just numbers on here. I print out the menu. So like you can scroll through menus of what different configuration thing you want to change. So I try to um, expose everything the board is using to do the, the patterns um, that you, so you can change it. And it would store it in a, the EEPROM on the processor. Uh, the interesting thing about there is some of the names of the menus, um, I had to be creative because there were certain letters I could not do in a seven segment. So you won't see anything with an M in there. You won't see anything with a W in there. Um, there there's a whole bunch of letters which I couldn't do. And I actually had menus. So I had, a, okay, what's another word that would kind of mean that thing? Um, so it kind of dictated uh, what, you, what you saw on that. Um, but this was an external board. Um, there's this ribbon cable, which connected up with the PSI. You plug it in, you configure it, you unplug it, and you're done. Um, but it required you to have access to the PSI, you know, to obviously to plug it in. Um, there is no processor on this thing. It uses the processor on the PSI. So this is just a display and input mechanism. Um, the code that runs this is mixed in with the code that runs the PSI on the CPU board. So let's go to um, uh, the next version, which was just a, another version of the um, Extreme, where I switched LEDs. I went to a, a, a different type of LED. I was using the, the WS2812s on the previous version. I wanted to try what they call the APA 102s, or um, another name for it, if you go to Adafruit, is called Dotstar. Um, and the one I was using before it, the WS, um, have a name of uh, NeoPixels. So if you hear those names, that's the mapping. Um, the difference between these LEDs, which is the same number of them, is the way they're driven. Now, the WS ones that I was using before have what they're called clockless. There, there isn't a clock line. There isn't something telling it how time is moving forward. Um, so when you talk to it, you have a very specific timing loop. You need to do some things in certain time intervals. Um, this one introduces a clock line. So instead of one wire going to the display board, there's two wires. Um, and, but it gives you more flexibility for when you're sending certain values. Um, it introduces a little more, uh, it's a little more complex, but it gives you more flexibility. But I wanted to try it out. Um, and I built up, I think, two, uh, well, I released two boards of this. This was actually for celebration. Um, it was an auction item. So there's two of them out in the world. Um, someone bid on them and got the only two out in the world. Um, well, it ha also had a special configuration board in the shape of uh, a rebel symbol. Um, but so that was my experimentation on it and worked out fine. Um, there's some other benefits from using the dot stars, but I won't go into that here. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, so that was the next version. Um, move ahead. We're in 2015 now. Uh, I did the ultimate version. The ultimate version has more LEDs again, um, but also I switched from using the 2812 to the 2812Bs. Uh, there's some subtle differences between them. The, the big one for me, though, was the form factor. They went from six pins to four pins. And that allowed me more flexibility in how I routed things. And that's the only reason why I was able to get them closer together is because I didn't have all these other pads that I had to go around. Um, so that was, the, that was the main reason for, for doing this and getting to um, more LEDs. Now, these CPU boards are pretty much the same. Now, I went to a, a newer process. Actually, I went to it um, uh, one slide back. That uh, you, it has more flash and has more RAM. It's basically double what the 16.8 the was, uh, the 32.8. So I had 32K of, of flash, and I had uh, 2K of RAM. Um, that came in handy with, because remember I said the configuration stuff is also in this flash. Um, and I wasn't really too concerned about flash side. It was, it was memory side. Every time I add more LEDs on here, um, it needs more RAM so I can do what I want to do on there. 
And, uh, and again, I'm still in 8-bit processor land here. Um, but I'm doing, th there's more happening on the boards than probably what people know. There's color blending, there, there, there's math going on there. Um, and that math does need memory. So my next version, which none of you have, because I never released it, um, was what I call first order. Now, this was coming from the concept of I am building these boards, and I keep on adding on more and more LEDs to get a, a more, uh, more control and a better looking display. So, well, what if I shot all the way to the other side? Instead of you know, 20 LEDs, what if I had 140 by 320 LEDs? I mean, that's better, right? So I started looking at, well, what would that mean? So I would need to have like a, an LCD display or some kind of display behind it. Um, and then I could do whatever pattern I want on there. And so I, I built up, I was actually pretty proud of this board. I mean, it looks like a stormtrooper. I mean, it's actually cut, it was, it was my first board where I, well, second board where I, I was a graphic artist um, on the actual um, PCB. And um, I went to a different processor um, to get some more flash because now I have this very high density screen and I need to, you know, draw stuff, so that, that could be uh, procedural, but then how do I configure it? Oh, okay, so I basically have kind of like a phone here now. Um, it has a touch display, well, let's, let's put that on there. You can configure it, just take this thing off, touch it, you know, and I can make like an interface. And, um, and you know, how very, and you know, this was also important, 16-bit color, so, I could do some, some cool stuff on this display and have this be both input and output. Um, and so I, I went down, down this road. And so next toolbox moment, what well, looks good on paper may not be practical. Um, there was some problems with this. Uh, one is you actually had to take this thing off of your droid to configure it. And I, but I said, you're gonna do this once, but what if people want to do it twice? <laughs> Okay, this is, this, is, this is not a good design. Um, also, it, uh, one of the great things about the LEDs I've been using before, and this is what people have commented on, is they're bright. They're really bright. So you can use them outdoors, and you can actually see the colors, um, as opposed to some of the other things where they're not as bright. Um, this has, that had the same problem of the LCDs aren't bright enough to drive in outdoors um, and, and actually get the benefit. Um, so, while an interesting um, detour uh, wasn't very practical. Uh, so fast forward to where we are today, uh, Phasmus. Um, that's these boards right here. Some changes went into that. Uh, so first, I needed to, I wanted to put more LEDs on there. What was holding me back now was the form factor of the actual LED, the five millimeter LED. There's only, you know, once they're butted up against each other, there's, you can't overlap them. That, that doesn't work in electronics. Um, so what, what else could I do? So I, looked, I was looking around and I found a 3.5 millimeter LED. Um, it, it basically mimics what a, um, a NeoPixel is, a, a WS. Um, it's made by a different company. Uh, but it uses pretty much the same protocol, um, just slightly different timings, but, but you could use the same code on it, and it, for most cases, it would run the same. Um, but with that 3.5 millimeters, I can get them closer together. So now we're up to 65. So that's a big jump from what we had before, and what it allowed me to do is I can actually have sweeping patterns, and they looked really cool. Um, and I know people are gonna say, yeah, that's great, but we don't have them yet. Um, I did, I built up a whole bunch of these things. There's hundreds of them sitting in my house. Um, and I'm very happy with the results here uh, because it, it hit all of the uh, goals I had. And it still has that same CPU board in the same kind of configuration. Uh, now, I'll talk a little bit about the configuration. I went through two iterations of that. I, I did the work for making the PSIs with 
a LCD display and I said, well, is there any way I can, I can leverage that work for the configuration board, at least that part of it? So instead of plugging in something with um, a few seven segment LEDs on there, I can plug in an LCD on there so you can configure it and you, then you would unplug that and you know, we'd, we'd all be happy. Um, uh, for a few reasons, this didn't work out well. Again, the CPU board is driving the code for this, so that 64K starts to go down very quickly. Um, I went back to the other processor, so I didn't have 64K anymore. Now I'm at 32. A whole bunch of reasons. Um, and so, so I, I decided, well, is there a way I can scale that down? Instead of doing the LCD display that I was using before, is there something else? So then I, I got to this, uh, what I call the PSI configure. So I, uh, this, this is that investment in money. I have probably every LCD um, OLED um, uh, panel in small form factor that had ever been made. So I could do R&D and figure out, and I, I settled on this one from um, Daigal. Uh, and it, is a OLED panel that is 160 by 128. And again, I'm still driving it from the CPU board, uh, but it is a, um, a screen where I can make menus. And so I made um, a whole bunch of graphics that allowed me to do all the configuration. I, w I, I went crazy on this thing. This is my uh, gaming background in doing um, uh, nice displays with vivid colors and stuff like that. So I put a lot more effort in this than I probably should have, but I had this whole carousel menu system working. Um, I got you know, my gaming background, um, a little D-pad here. Uh, you have your you know, two buttons. So this kind of looks like an Xbox controller or, you know, or you know, a, a PS, uh, PS2 controller. Um, so, so this was my configuration for it, and you know it. Well, let's just say for now that was my solution. Um, then I started working on some other stuff, and I said, "Well, okay, is there another type of controller that instead of using that display, and I'll give reasons why I wanted to move away from this display." Um, and somehow use the LEDs on the actual PSI, um, and so, but still have the controls, ex external controls. So I tried something with a joystick, um, an actual joystick, since, since I made a D-pad, and I said you basically have a joystick, um, and some buttons and something you can hold in your hand. So a poor man's nunchuck. Uh, and so I made uh, another version of the controller. Um, and then I came to the realization that external accessories add complexity, and this is stupid. Um, I, have, I have a more and more detailed display. Um, each time I do these iterations and people ask me to get more LEDs on them and I do that, um, that gives me better capabilities of showing stuff on there. Now we only use it for sweeping patterns, but is there some other things that we could put on there, like configuration uh, information? So that was my realization. And that brings us to the next iteration. So um, I call these the Cassians. And uh, again, I switched out the hardware. Well, I switched out the parts I'm using. The hardware is actually maintaining the same. I mean, I'll go into that a little later. Um, but I am... Um, bumping it up each time. And for this was, okay, remember I talked about I did those two-off displays for celebration using the APA 102s? And at this point, I think I, it may have been Joy Monkey, someone turned me on to, hey, have you seen these two millimeter LEDs out there? Could we do something with that? And it's like, oh, I didn't see them, let me take a look. And it's like, oh, damn, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, even before I had the LEDs, I started designing a board. It's like, okay, I can get the spec. Um, let me start designing the board and see how close can I get these things. Now, one thing I didn't say about the um, SK6812s um, that I've used on the Phasmas is that was the transition for me 
from being able to hand solder them. You know, me, and my hand shakes when I do soldering at times. Um, so it doesn't make good for little tiny parts, especially when they're a matrix and they're expensive. Um, so this, I, I did a transition before this to hot air. Um, I don't like toaster ovens. I, I like having more control over what's going on. Um, large scale manufacturing have a down pat, you know, they know profiles, they can do stuff. Uh, me one off, uh, I'm, I'm still gonna do it by hand, but I'm gonna use better tools. And the better tool for me here was hot air, um, solder paste, and I can get them, the LEDs right where I want them, and I can heat up the board, and I can visually see if I have anything. I can test the board, and I can rework it if I need to. Um, but uh, but th that was necessary for, for this level. Um, there's, there's over 200 LEDs on this board. Um, this is the exact, I, th this shape hasn't changed since the beginning. And by the way, this shape is the shape you'll see on the um, silk screen, the circle around it. Um, and that's my keep out area. That keep out area is for Doug and Michael's um, PSI holders. These things will fit right in, into it. Um, you'll be able to see all the LEDs, none of them will be cut off, um, and you won't touch any of the metal on it. Um, so I had to keep that same form factor, but each time getting more and more LEDs. So 204 LEDs on there. So the, I showed this to some people, and the first thing they said to me is, can you get more LEDs on there? Um, <laughs> it's like, what, what the hell? Um, <laughs> They actually do. And it's online. So, um, and so um, table that for a second. Uh, so then I you know, did the LED board. So uh, another thing you noticed about my designs is I'm keeping up with that LED board, CPU board. Um, and they have the same pattern. Let's see if I got one here. Yeah. They all use the same pattern. There's three pins, so you can never put it in wrong. Um, and um, there's, there's multiple powers and, and ground coming to it, and then um, a signal and for ones that need it, a clock. I use that same pattern for everything, so I can in, uh, interchange LED boards and CPU boards. And it's just the code on the CPU board that does whatever display is. So it has to know what kind of display it is, um, but I can do this mixing matching. And this is what I did here is, this is the same LED board I did for the Cassians, but I have the Cassian K2, and that uses a, um, a different processor with a different amount of RAM, because that was my limitation. So uh, the previous one actually, um, I don't know if people noticed when I showed that slide, um, it had, Um, this different processor here, and a lot of memory. This is a, a, an ARM chip. So I went from an 8-bit processor to a 32-bit processor um, to try it out. And um, I didn't like the results. Uh, and and it's, it's mainly it's because of this processor. Um, the environment I was using is, is my, my original intent was always, how can I make this accessible to um, developers, to uh, the people in the club. I wanted to stay within the Arduino world, at least. Um, now, I go outside of it for my code, but to build it, you can stay inside that framework, inside that IDE. Um, and I didn't like some of the support they had for, for this processor, and I was ending up rewriting things, and it's like, okay, this, for a few reasons, that's where I decided to go to the K2, go to this other, processor. Now, it's, this is, went backwards into 8-bit land, but th this is the X mega as opposed to the mega, and there's more things on this chip that I was going to make use of. Um, and, but this is that idea that I can interchange CPU boards and LED boards. Uh, but then I still get the question, can you get more LEDs on that board? Um, and so I did the Snoke version, uh, and this one added in one, two, three, four more LEDs. That's the limit. I, I, there, there's no other place until they make one millimeter uh, RGB LEDs that I can get um, any more uh, LEDs on this board. 
Um, there, there's ramifications for doing this too. You know, none of this is for free. Every time I put another LED on the board means it needs more power. Um, more power means that you need to supply it more. It means that your batteries drain quicker. It means technically this board gets hotter. Um, so th th there, there's a downside for going down this, this path. And I, I don't know how people are gonna take this, but I don't think this is a good solution. Uh, I'm actually sticking with the phasmas as I think that's the right sweet spot for, for granular um, uh, sweeping patterns. And by the way, I don't know how many people know this. There, there's a pin on, the, uh, on every PSI board that you have, I think pretty much, maybe not the early ones, but after that, um, that has a demo mode. And if you put a jumper on that, um, you'll see a whole bunch of other patterns besides the sweep back and forth. Um, now, no one uses those, uh, but it does show off what a higher density matrix can do for you. Um, there are some chase patterns, and when you have more LEDs, you see that chase pattern looks a lot finer, it looks cooler. Um, there's a particle pattern when you have more LEDs, that particle pattern looks really cool. I'm hoping that one day Lucasfilm sees this stuff and says, you know, someone has it in demo mode, say, let's use that in a movie. You know, that, that's an interesting pattern. Back when we did the first R2, you know, we had this mechanical thing, that's all we could do. Well, well now we're, you know, many years forward, 40 years forward, we could do some more stuff. Um, so I'm hoping that someone sees that someday and, you know, we start seeing some other stuff. But um, I, I don't believe, well, I, sh I shouldn't say this, uh, I, I was going to say I don't believe I'm going to do a run of these anytime um, because there's, well, I probably will do a run. Uh, <laughs> The, the problem is this ain't going to be cheap either. Because right now, when I, when I did um, that board, which I have up, up front, um, you're talking a couple hundred dollars for that board, that one thing. There's no way I'm going to ask you guys for a couple hundred dollars for a PSI that is supposed to do a pattern sweeping back and forth. So, you know, it's just, I, I can't do that to you. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the good news is when I did that, to today, the prices have come down a lot. Um, so, you know, I buy these things by, well, uh, normally I buy them by the thousand. Uh, these I buy by the 1500, because um, they're smaller, so they can fit more on our, on our reel. Um, so, they would be more money, because there's more money into them. Uh, but, I, I, again, I was looking for that sweet spot. The, the Phasma seemed like it was, it was the right sweet spot. Um, I probably will do some of these uh, at some point, uh, but, uh, but I don't think this is the primary one. I, I, I think the Phasmas are the primary one. Um, but again, those CPU boards and LED boards are interchangeable, so we can get the, uh, the interesting stuff, but we can uh, mix and match LEDs. So I, I'm going a little over. Um, so I made some more LEDs. We're back into, uh, into Armland again, but I'm using a different one. I'm using an uh, ST um, uh, chip here. The main reason for this is, yeah, I'm getting some more memory and, and stuff which, which I um, can make use of. It's this, it's the speed. Um, so another change I've made, which is a, basically a software one, because it's you know, just an IO line, is I switched from I2C to serial. Um, and all my boards now, moving forward, are gonna be running serial instead of I2C. Lots of problems with I2C. We can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, but there is a club standard-ish um, that uh, people have been using serial, and so I'm jumping on the bandwagon. Paul Murphy and I are working together. Um, we are using the, the Jowl Light um, uh, protocol, so I made my stuff map directly to what they're doing, um, and we've I've extended it to do additional stuff, um, but it's all serial. The reason I need the faster processors is um, when you're doing this stuff with this chips, you have to use interrupts, and on the um, Atmel stuff on the 8-bit stuff, 
you're running into problems because you're, if you're stopping interrupts, you're not getting communication information, you're losing data. So this allows me to do it well, um, going faster. Um, and this was another toolbox moment. Um, I moved away from the AVRs. I mean, it was familiar to me. I was very comfortable in it, but it doesn't mean it's the right solution. Um, so I had to be flexible in saying, okay, well, what is a better solution for what are my problems? Um, a little bit about the hardware. I said it's very simple. I need to speed up even more. Um, so I have... I try to do as much as I can on the, on the microcontroller, so it has a lot of capabilities, and I just have it hooked up to the display. The display is hooked up in a serpentine pattern, so all of the LEDs fit it, uh, feed into the next one. Um, I have uh, regulation coming into it, so you can feed it more than 5 volts or 3.3, depending on the processor. You feed it standard stuff. Um, and then I started doing configuration, actually, on the board. So no more external configuration, but no expensive stuff. Um, so I just put a potentiometer on there, a couple of buttons, and you see your configuration on, on the actual display. Um, so no more unplugging and plugging in boards. Um, and so uh, back when I was doing the configuration boards, one of the things I uh, try to do is use the exact same footprint for all the controllers, even though they're all different stuff, you can plug any of them in and it can detect which one it is. Did some magic with floating lines and stuff that I could detect. Um, but it, it kept that same form factor. Again, I'm looking for interchange. Um, firmware, let me go quickly through this. Um, I have a configuration file where I have every type of PSI, and I use the same code, it's very modular. Um, anytime I bring up a new board, I port over the original code and add the additional stuff just to drive this board. Um, so there is one set of code that does all the logic. Um, the original design had uh, the concept of bitmaps for all the, the patterns, and so I had these big tables. I didn't have a lot of LEDs, so these tables weren't really big. Um, and I, the, basically, the loop was I, I had all this stuff in RGB, I have these bitmap patterns, and I just decompress them and spit them out to the board. And that's what you, you see uh, on the display. Very simple loop here. Um, that I outgrew that, and the current setup is I actually don't work in RGB space anymore. I work in H, HSV, um, use saturation uh, value. Um, so I can get better control over color. I convert it to RGB, um, and then I have a procedural system in here. So there's a whole bunch of opcodes. And so you can program these boards with scripts and say, I want to do this step, then that step. I want to delay for this amount of time and, and all, do all that kind of stuff um, inside this procedure. It's being fed by stuff in your EEPROM so you can configure it and it will remember that and do that all the time. And then I added the concept of this virtual matrix. So it doesn't care what kind of display is on there. Um, it has this virtual thing, and you can, you can talk to it in, in an XY location, and then it knows how to map that to a particular LED on the board. So when you're writing these procedures, you don't need to know the physical layout here. There's a mapping. Um, and so my toolbox item here was keep the hardware simple, solve it in software. Um, and then keep the software modular so I can use these as building blocks. Um, so where are we going with this? Or where am I going with this? Okay, so the, the future for me is more industrial, um, uh, more fault tolerant. Um, I've added, I've removed um, uh, header pins and I'm using RJ45 and RJ12 connectors. Very solid connectors, not gonna come out. Um, I am use, uh, I have this board here that I'm uh, experimenting with, which is uh, DMX. If it, anyone does theater stuff or um, LED lighting, um, there's a whole protocol around this that you can plug in standard devices. Um, this stuff is just another one of those. Um, you can set the, uh, DMX works with channels. You can set what channel this stuff wants to listen to. Um, 
And I've actually done PSIs for this. I've done HPs for this. This works with JoyMonkey's um, logics. They all fit into this board here. It actually has connections for all of that. Set one set of power into this thing. It powers everything else. Um, they all use the same protocol. Um, and you can drive that by DMX in, or you can drive it by any kind of other input. Um, so this is kind of my future. Questions? And I think we have one minute for questions. <laughs> can you get any more LEDs on <laughs> No. Next question. <laughs> Tomorrow will you have an updated presentation of this? <laughs> no. <laughs> any other questions? Um, you yes. said DMX earlier. Have you looked at ArtNet? No, I have not. Um, and I, I have to be careful what I say here. I'm looking at DMX for a reason. Um, and, uh, and it has been able to do all the stuff we needed to do, um, but uh, it was interesting. It was, a, a, like I told you, my motivation is I like to learn. I'm a builder, and I like to um, kind of innovate and um, iterate on things, and this was a great example for doing that. Okay, one question which I was expecting to get, which I didn't, is what's the delay in getting the um, phasmas out? Um, so I talked about this board here, uh, this configuration board. I talked about the um, display on there. This display has been nothing but problems for me from a programming side. Um, and so the way it works is uh, all the graphics are stored on this display. There was uh, basically this is a way of summarizing. There was a lot of bugs in their firmware, which I had to help them fix. Um, and I and Every time I felt there was something I did wrong and I would debug it and it wasn't and it turned back. So this was a, a nightmare for me, uh, iteration loop, um, to the point of I actually had to build hardware so I could reflash their boards with better firmware that allows me to get new boards. So that was, um, that was the, the major thing that held up development. Um, everyone probably, or most people know that there was other reasons after to actually get them shipped out. Um, but the, the, uh, this is the graphics that actually goes onto this, uh, into this card, and this is what caused me problems. Um, so what's the answer to this is next month. Next month, I'm, I'm getting these out there. Um, I have to reprogram each one of these displays. Um, so it's just, just a matter of the, the time. I have to program the boards, program the displays. The hardware has been done for years um, and get it out to you. And so that's it. Thank you.